So growing conventionally, as people may or may not know in the Bahamas, oh, and by the way, this is a picture of our um, aquaponic system here in Freeport, uh, blooming quite nicely. The soil here is very, very rocky um, and is limestone, is sand, is hard to uh, make irrigation with. And thanks, Pam. <laughs> uh, so I began to make my own soil, which is fine. I like to compost and all that stuff. And of course, what you get from it is amazing. But it becomes uh, expensive to buy soil, supplement soil, and then begin a, a whole issue of irrigation. And again, you don't want to waste water in any event. So I have a picture here of my chickens, some of my chickens. And as you can see, even though they've had time in that pen there, to dig up and uh, nutrate, uh, you know, put nutrients themselves into the soil. As you can see, the soil grows weeds and is exceedingly rocky. So we have to turn our minds to grow, growing probably unconventionally. Next slide, please. So my alternatives, personally, I started looking into hydroponic systems and aquaponic systems. I really did like the um, hydroponic systems, so I started with that. So if you can next slide, Pam. So the basic hydroponic system, and in this picture here, this, this is part of what we call a vertigo system. And this is the top part or the T connection. I don't know how much of it you can see, but basically it's drip fed irrigation. Uh, that's the top of the top of uh, three or four stacks. You'll see that in a bit. And that is the sleeve that holds the tubing, which you see coming out to the side that drips fluid and nutrients throughout it, um, as long as your pump is turned on. Next picture, please. That's kale and lettuce, by the way. So there are different types of uh, hydroponic systems that you can grow. Uh, this is what's referred to as a wick system. And basically the water does, it has a reservoir, it has your air stones. Obviously there's elements everybody needs in growing, sun, sun, some sort of medium to grow in, water, nutrients. So this is a wick system that just applies the same thing. And by wick, you'll see that the water then circulates via the wick from one growing medium into the water. Next picture, please. This is just a water culture, uh, very, very simple. Again, aeration, airline, air pump, and floating plants with your roots in there. You obviously, at some point, are gonna open the tank of that and feed it some nutrients. That's what it needs there in this picture. It's not really showing you where the nutrients come from, but you get the gist of it. Next picture, please. So this is an ebb and flow. Um, so sometimes you do have an overflow of water, some sort of catchments, some sort of reservoir, uh, reservoirs, but it's the same basic principle that you're working on with the, um, with it's almost like a tidal, uh, I guess you would say, but again, this you would need to put uh, some nutrients into. This is an NFT, uh, which is, you'll see a lot of people use this especially with piping, plastic or uh, PCP piping. You'll see little holes with the neck cups, neck cups. And, and this is the same sort of thing, but the nice thing about this is it seems to actually give you a nice return on your, on your flow as well. Again, um, there's a nutrient pump. I was gonna say, I don't know where the nutrients are, but there's a nutrient pump. Next picture, please. And this is aeroponic. So it, it works more in a misting than in full drenching. And obviously there's a pump, there's water and it flows it up and keeps it circulating. So they're not actually drenched, drenched or sitting in the water itself. Um, I, I think this is probably good for things that may not like full saturation of water, maybe some herbs and things like this. Um, and lettuce could grow in there and things like basil but this is probably better for things that don't like to actually be having a bath all the time. That's what I would recommend that for. Next picture, please. So this is, this is on the left of your screen. You'll see a, 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 a paint bucket, it's probably a recycled paint bucket that someone, in fact, my pastor at church has cut holes in. Use noodle rings, that's the, the glowing, sort of green you see with, with it, the lettuce is growing out of instead of 
as a medium and without a neck cuff, although he has some sort of net sleeve, which I thought was pretty brilliant. Inside that there is of course water and he feeds the nutrients into the bucket. There's no fish in there, but he feeds the nutrients into the bucket when they need replenishing. Obviously in this system, he also needs to replenish the water as it's evaporated and used. On the right hand side is the full vertigo system. If Luckner is attending today, he, he knows what that looks like. He actually helped me with this one. And so you can see that there are three to four towers. They are again fed nutrition through a, a bucket or a barrel that has a submersible pump. It then pumps throughout the pipes and drips feeds as I showed the T connection earlier has a drip feed all the way down to the very, very bottom. Now, what we did with the very, very basic, uh, big, we put a bigger bucket on the bottom because you don't want to lose any water. You don't want to lose any nutrients. They're very precious. And so we would put things in there like okra that could grow quite large. In each of these vertical, vertical systems, um, uh, this vertigo system, sorry, each, each corner of the styrofoam pot grows a separate plant and as you can see on top we grow tomatoes which is a bit bigger or peppers so you can see from that how many you can grow in one vertical space which i loved love the idea of being able to control the nutrients being able to control the water flow obviously here we have some rain lots of rain sometimes and no rain lots sometimes so it's nice to be able to control that but I didn't like the fact that we lost a lot of water because you don't, um, you have to keep re refilling, you have to keep refilling nutrients, which is absolutely fine. I'm not saying it wasn't fantastic, it was fantastic. But then I learned about aquaponics. Next slide, please, or next picture, please. So, with hydroponic, again, conventional growing aquaponics, you need the very, very basics. And this is the very, very basics elements and needs. You got your water source, which if you're doing hydroponics, well, if you're doing conventional growing, it's irrigation. If you are doing hydroponics, it's then drip irrigation, the water just drip down. And of course, aquaponics, we're, we're floating in it, we're swimming in it. You need sunlight. Obviously, photosynthesis is very, very important. Uh, the substrate here is a growing medium, uh, which we use. We've always used coconut core for various reasons. I'll explain a bit later. And then, of course, your nutrients. If you are growing conventionally, you might be uh, using Miracle Grow or fish um, emulsion. Anything you're using as a nutrient. If you're doing hydroponics, you're feeding them hydroponic nutrients. And most of those, I will just also point out, are actually very organic. Um, when I don't have fish in my uh, aquaponic system, we will use the hydroponic nutrients because once we add the fish, it, it doesn't bother them at all. It's all natural. So, and all of these vary on where you're growing, how you're growing, but those are your basic elements for growing anything. Next picture, please. Come. So there are the primary differences is set on a very, very small scale for you. Um, hydroponics, as you can read there, refers to growing plants without soil, as again, we use coconut uh, core, but you can use perlite, wool rock, um, whatever rocks themselves, whatever medium you prefer to use. Um, and you, well, they've explained it for you there, water, gravel, sand, and nutrients are applied, you know, again, you apply those. Now, in the aquaponic system, it is a subset of hydroponics, although I believe that in my brief research, it was the Aztecs that seems to have come up first with the aquaponics, which is brilliant and has, of course, been perfected since then. Uh, the plants are grown without soil. Again, we use uh, a different medium in water, um, hence the term aquaponics and is um, sustainable, it, recy it cycles the nutrients, which are supplied by byproduct byproducts of the fish, which is poop, and the plants uh, then reciprocate by filtering out and cleaning the water. So what I loved about the aquaponics was that basically you feed the fish, the water recycles, whatever the nutrients are needed within the water are carried through the roots, 
and it goes back to the tank nice and clean. So there's no, sometimes you have to replenish water. Obviously there's some evaporation here or there or spill here and there, but I liked the water saving element and the more natural way to feed your plants. Next slide, please. So it is one of the best ways of growing a sustainable food. It's its own little ecological system. And of course, the second leg to the aquaponics is whatever you're using as your nutrient feeder. It, if it's edible fish, it's something that you then harvest at one point. And that's the second leg of the business there or your aquaponics system there. So as I tell the kids, when the zombie apocalypse comes, at least we'll have some salad and fish. Uh, next picture please come so again a very very basic premises of it plants water fish so that's a very very basic way and you can see the water goes in it flows around um, and just recirculates again it's one continuous cycle next picture please come and this gives you a little bit more of an explanation of how it breaks down and how it works so it's, it's, and you'll see number one is at the bottom where the water, clean water is um, contaminated with, with fish food. So that's very important what you feed them. And of course their byproduct waste. And it continues around the nitrogen cycle. So then from there it goes to where the fish produce the ammonia and bacteria will break them down into nitrates, which then go up, your pump carries the water up and the bacteria, turns the ammonia into the nitrates, which then feed the plants, which the plants then absorb. And then it goes back into the water again, clean for your fish to do their business all over again and start the cycle. The plants basically draw the nitrogen from the water itself, which feeds the plants, cleans the water, makes it safe and everybody's happy and the cycle starts again. Next slide, please Pam. So these are the benefits of, I felt of the aquaponic system. And that is our smaller aquaponic system right there. Um, a very red picture of myself. Um, I like the fact that what, what moved me was that the aquaponics does use less water than any other type of gardening. And I know that's at some point going to be a problem in our future. So up to one tenth of the amount is used, uh, is less, is used less. Uh, it only uses 10, sorry, 10 at uh, one tenth of the amount that's usually used in traditional gardening. Um, it requires less time and it really does than regular fish keeping. I check the fish in the morning, in the afternoon, I give them some food and um, they do the work for me. So I, I appreciate that very, very much. It's completely organic. Again, depending on what you're feeding your fish, for instance, fish don't eat soy meal. They don't eat soybean. If you have anything that has soya, in it, it, they won't eat it. It will sink to the bottom of your tank and basically gum up your stuff. And again, if your fish are not eating, they're not giving you their byproduct. So it's a wholly, um, completely organic. Uh, you cannot use harsh chemicals. Obviously you'll poison your fish, let alone, you know, um, not be good for your plants or for selling uh, any food. The aquaponic beds are raised. Now, obviously, mine could be raised a lot more, which is something we are working on in the second system that World Central Kitchen is helping us repair. And it takes less time. So if I plant a seed, I usually set it to germinate for a few days. Um, my duration with this plant is going to be four to six weeks, which I appreciate a great deal as a very impatient person. Um, and it can be grown anywhere. You can do it inside. You can do it outside. You can do it in the greenhouse. You can do it in your bedroom with one small tank and one beta fish if you really, really, uh, uh, really, really want to. And you can adapt it for whatever you need to use it for, whether you're feeding your, yourself uh, a more organic diet or you're feeding your entire community. So it's, it's very flexible. Next slide, Pam. So the elements for constructing the system itself now that you have the basic elements, begin with your fish tank. Next slide, please, Pam. So this is actually a pool. It's a large above ground pool and they work 
fantastic. Uh, we don't tend to swim in them, but the fish, that's their home. And this works fantastically for our first and smaller system. Um, and we've, I've given you on the side here um, how many gallons per fish you will need. Dep and this is based on tilapia. So you just need, you would need 16 fish for 50 gallons of the water. They obviously grow, they obviously breed. Um, before you harvest, they get quite big. So it also depends on whether you're getting fingerlings, which is what they call smaller tilapia that come to you, or whether you're getting full, full size fish. But that's your basic plate for it. Now, you can use um, ponds that you put into a, a piece of property. We're actually doing three on the property we have right now that are, you know, huge that we will then be able to stock for other aquaponic systems uh, to help other people instead of having to also always transport things in again from the United States. So we'll be putting three in here to grow stock, not only for ourselves, but anybody else that may require having to import that kind of thing. Next slide, please. Come. So after your pond is in, you build your bed. Please notice the puppy is trying very hard to assist. I'm gonna tell you right now, he's not very good at his job. Um, what we do is, is uh, obviously carve out, measure out the beds per the foam boards. We like to fit two per bed. So you have two sides. So that's how we measure them out. And we then <clears throat> put breeze block, concrete block on the bottom. We then cover with sand. Uh, so that we don't have pointy and sticky out bits that would really damage any liners. We paint the wood. We are now actually using marine wood because it's more hardy for the uh, high humidity and the water, obviously, it's going to sit in from time to time. But then once that is all done, we then line the beds. Next slide, please, Pam. So there's the bed that you just saw being built, uh, being rebuilt. And that is all fully lined. You can see in this picture the piping that is on the left of the bed. You can also see that there are air rocks placed throughout the bed to ensure, even though the water cycles, to ensure that there's always full aeration. Now, once this is done is when we can then start uh, the next step. Next, uh, obviously fill your bed up with water. <laughs> next slide, please, Pam. So as you can see, this is double. Uh, so we have two lanes <clears throat> of the foam boards filled with neck cups with our plants in them. And right in the front, you can see the pipe, one of the pipes that's gone in that will be used in recycling the water throughout. And again, on the left side of the bed, you can also see all the piping that comes in and little bits of the, of the wires that go down to show the air rocks. So that's your top bed structure there. Next picture, please, Pam. And that's just a little side, a little side bit to show where the piping is fitted. It then goes down um, into the ground and goes to the to the main pump area where the pond would then put that through uh, the piping, uh, and it branches out into each one of the beds. Next slide, please, Pam. So this is actually an outside pump, not a submersible pump. I don't know why the puppy's in there. He's, he's just wants to photobomb everything. Um, we have this like this temporarily because on the island there was, there was no submersible pumps to buy. A lot of people, because of the saltwater contamination, obviously set back a lot of things, especially for aquaponics. But we were able to get these pumps once we had uh, processed enough fresh water to start refilling. We were able to get these pumps, which could circulate from the outside. Now, bear in mind, at the time that this is, is in, our fish have not been put in yet, had not been put in at the time. So, and in fact, I spent the morning trying to catch tilapia. I am not a fisherwoman. But uh, they will be there. There's some in there now. So we will then have the submersible pump, not an outside pump, which would then obviously pump the nutrients and the water throughout the system. Next slide, please, Pam. 
So these are then, the next step is your fuel, the real stars of the show, I believe. We use Jamaican red tilapia. Don't ask me why they're called Jamaican. I don't know, but they are, um, they're fast growers. They are very good at giving you waste, which is what you really need. Now, a lot of people don't really care for tilapia these days, but my tilapia or our tilapia, I should say, are 100% organic. So we do have a market here for them, especially now that the hotels and everything is opening back up. The shrimp on your left is a Pacific white shrimp, which is a freshwater shrimp. We had a shrimp farm here at one point and unfortunately it folded up. However, the aquaculturist from there has joined me to help me with aquaculture. And so we will be fin filling up the other, we have two more ponds to the bigger system that we're rebuilding currently, thanks to World Central Kitchen. And we will be filling up, that takes two ponds, so two of those big pools you saw. And so we will be filling up one with the white Pacific shrimp. And that's a three month harvest. So that's a quicker harvest. Um, I will see how they do with byproduct for us, whether or not they're viable for us to keep as a aquaponic fuel. The one on the right is an Australian red claw, which is a freshwater crayfish or lobster, which I thought was very interesting. Again, we're gonna try that in the third pot, in the third pool and see how much of a champion provider they are of fuel and um, how they sell um, as a second leg to the aquaponic business. But really those tilapia, they know what they're doing. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So this is a picture of the medium that we do use, which is the coconut core. I, I prefer the coconut core to anything else really and truly because it's very resistant to mold and fungus, and it's obviously in moisture all the time, which means we can recycle it. Now, the big barrel, it's a 55 barrel on the left-hand side. You will see that there are roots and stuff in there. Well, that just gives us nutrients. So I like to churn that up in there. Um, you know, you never can go wrong with a little bit more nutrient. And then also we use the neem cake that some of us saw the seminar on uh, a few weeks ago. And something I learned from that seminar was that the neem cake that is left over when you are done straining it, you can actually use um, in here. Again, it's antifungal, it's antibacterial. It also has its own nutrients in it. So we just churn everything up in there and recycle it. Again, to save having to import a lot of things. Um, at some point, we will hopefully get a mulcher because we have a lot of coconuts and start making our own core here that we can then help other people with. Um, the picture in the middle is, I believe those are my... Um, red oak or red crisp seedlings in there. They've probably just gone in for maybe two weeks, maybe a week and a half, two weeks. And they're all sitting in a net cup in the coconut core, um, happily sucking up nutrients from the water. The right-hand side picture is a sweet crisp lettuce. And I put that in there to show an example of gross overcrowding. So each one of these, and you can see, how they start off and how close they are. So imagine if we didn't have a program, which we didn't at the time this picture was taken, a program whereby after two weeks, we separate to about 50%. And then after another two weeks, we separate to another 50%, which gives us two plants on each board that makes up our complete spring mix. However, when it's overcrowded like this, there's not enough sunlight getting to them. They don't have enough space, enough air. They're holding moisture. The underneath of that is gonna be mushy lettuce. So that's again, the very basic element of needing enough sun, needing enough air. It obviously has water, but obviously has nutrients. It's a beautiful lettuce, but it's, it's overcrowding. And so the product will have to throw away the bottom half of most of those, I would think at that time, which again, recycles and goes to my chickens. Next slide, please. Obviously maintain your water, your um, nutrients you wanna know, and this is what we use, it's quick, it's easy, it's simple. 
We have uh, more test kits that are much more complicated, but in all honesty, this one works. If we find a problem here, then we get out one of those big fancy kits and have to start working that. Um, the nutrients, obviously, it, a strip like this will tell you where you are in your range of your different nutrients, magnesium, calcium, I mean, everything. It, they're very, very good. And then, of course, your pH level. For me, I like to keep mine around 6.5. It's good for the fish. It's good for the plants. It's fantastic. So obviously looking at things as well is a good indicator if you don't have test strips on you. If we're growing basil and the leaves start cupping, I know there's too much calcium in the water. And of course we have a lot of limestone and calcium. So that's our biggest problem that we have here in the Bahamas. And so for that, I usually combat it with a chelated iron. Um, look at your fish, see how they're swimming, see how they're doing, they should be if you're using the red Jamaican ones or just red ones, they um, they have a pretty they have a pretty color. So just check your color, how they're swimming, whether they're going to the bathroom, whether they're eating food, and you know talk to them daily. They they do appreciate it as do the plants. Uh, next slide, please. Picture. So some people are growing outside. The vertical system um, I was showed you earlier grows outside. Uh, that was used outside, built outside, and some people have aquaponics that also grow outside because they maybe haven't been able to put up a shade house, can't afford a shade house, don't want to use a shade house. However, there are certain things you will need to look out for, and that little green thing right there is definitely one of your biggest biggest enemies here, which is um, part of the white fly, I think, and um, yeah, they're everywhere. They're terrible. We try not to kill them, but you know, they have to go. So on the next slide, please. So what we, what I try to do with mine is I try to surround anything with beneficial plants and with deterring plants. So a nice deterring plant to put around a system like all the way around. And I put them up and down the rows in my system if I have holes in the shade house is the marigold. They don't like the marigold. They don't want to come near the marigold. They're not about the marigolds. Um, so that's a good one. And it's also an edible flower in case you're ever catering to any restaurants. Uh, the other thing that's really cool is beneficial plants like the milkweed. And the milkweed brings things like this beautiful butterfly here who will eat every aphid in sight. So that is a very beneficial plant. There are many others, you know, that you can find that are like it, but that is... The one I like the, the best, it germinates very easily. It spreads seeds everywhere very easily. And it brings all the bugs you really and truly need. Now, if you are growing inside and you're not just growing lettuce, you're growing things like tomatoes that will need pollination. Um, just remember in those situations in a greenhouse, you're not going to get germination. There's no bees in there. Well, there shouldn't be. If you are outside, and growing outside, you may need to assist with pollination because you've put a lot of things around that may deter some of them. One of the things that's a big deterrent that you would definitely have to help pollination with is what they call silver mulch. And what silver mulch is, is something that looks like aluminum foil almost, sheets of aluminum foil, but in big, big. So it's silver, it looks like something maybe from the space station. And you put it around the system and the bugs cannot determine whether the sun is up or down and therefore cannot even fly across it to get to your crop. So if you're using something like that, you will need to pollinate yourself, which mean, means you need to walk around with a few Q-tips in one flower and the next flower and the next flower imitating a bee. So there's other ways to combat than using any chemicals. Again, I use the neem cake, uh, spray it on our stuff daily. It is organic. It has no health um, deterrence at all for humans. It's actually something that a lot of people take daily for uh, all the beneficial things that it does. And it does eventually whittle down any problems you do have. So I do, I do think you should use that if you're growing outside. But um, again, be careful of things like bees and stuff. You don't want to deter them. Next uh, picture, please, Pam. Oh, so I have closing remarks. So this is, this is the lettuce. On the right-hand side are the uh, different varieties of lettuce we grow in the system. 
that makes up our spring mix. It's eight different two, four, six, eight different kinds of lettuce, uh, both in green and red. It's truly beautiful. And as you can see on the left-hand side, it's like a quilted patchwork in an English countryside. <laughs> um, it actually looks a little overcrowded there, but this is why we built the second system that um, to fulfill the orders and, and what was going on here with actually having something people can pick up and buy here and know it's organic, know that it's fresh. One of the indicators for us in the grocery store is you always pick up uh, your box of, of lettuce in the grocery store and turn it over to see how much of it is actually rotten and how much you're gonna get out of that. And I love when people do that to mine and they look at it and I'm like, it was picked this morning. It's not gonna even think about deterring for five or six weeks. And that's only if you don't treat it well. So really proud of what we're doing here. Really proud of hopefully going forward with making the, well, for me, Freeport, Grand Bahama, then the Bahamas, then the, the sister islands, you know, in the Caribbean and West Indies who are in the same exact position. We are waiting for imports. You probably guys have better soil than we do, um, but I'm real proud to be doing this and I hope it makes a difference and it shows the world what we need to do, shows our country what we need to do for food sustainability. It is going to be a very important thing soon enough. Thank you guys so much for allowing me to chat.